All right, so I'm going to begin. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our open house webinar uh, at the Art Photography Program at Syracuse University. My name is Yasser Agour. I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Laura Heyman, Doug Dubois, Susanna Saylor. Uh, we are here to have a conversation with some alumni uh, who are going to talk to us a little bit about kind of real world experiences of what it's like to uh, leave Syracuse and, and try to make a living. Uh, just a few housekeeping issues of those of you that are just coming in late. We are trying to figure out the closed caption, but once that's available, you should see a little icon on the bottom of your screen that you can turn on or off. Uh, for those of you that are here to talk about the program, as soon as the panel discussion is over, we will be, uh, the faculty will be available to answer any specific questions you have for both the undergraduate and the graduate program. So please do stay on. Uh, you'll see that we have both a Q&A function and a chat function. We're going to use a chat function for just information. You can see uh, our the faculty email as well as our panelists Instagram and websites and any other kind of information that will be available for us throughout the uh, question and answer. However, if you do want to have a specific question later for the panelists, please use your Q&A icon at the center of the bottom of Zoom. Okay, so let me, uh, let me begin. I wanted to say one of our big traditions at uh, Syracuse Photography, those of you alumni will remember this, that every year we have a big uh, event in New York City where we invite alumni to New York City uh, to my house and we have a big dinner party and current students and alumni get to interact and we get to you know meet our old students and see what they're up to. Obviously, because of COVID, that was not possible this year. A lot of things got canceled. A lot of bad things, obviously, from the fallout uh, in, in COVID. But it does, COVID did provide us with this great opportunity to bring together uh, a lot of our former alumni. We have six alumni here, three undergraduates and three graduate students. We're going to ask them a few questions uh, about their experiences, both at SU and mainly about what it's like to go onto the job market and what the job market is like these days. Um, one advantage, of course, of, of COVID is that we can all dress fairly comfortably. I'm in my sweatpants over here, very nice designer sweatpants, but sweatpants nonetheless. So we can all be relaxed from our homes. Um, we, our students from Syracuse, after they graduate, they kind of scatter all over the country uh, and, and indeed all over the world at this point. I just wanted to ask real quick where, where our panelists are right now. Uh, Aaron? Okay, I'm gonna. I am in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Cincinnati, okay. Jamie? Uh, I'm in Syracuse. <laughs> Syracuse. Rose? I'm in Central Florida, close to Sarasota, but I live in Miami. Cool. So you're, you're the one we're the most jealous of right now. Joe? <laughs> uh, I'm in New Paltz, New York, where I live. Cool. And Nydia? Uh, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta and Ohima. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. I'm in, I'm in Brooklyn as well. And I think uh, the rest of the faculty, I believe, are in Syracuse. Um, so I'm just going to begin with bios. Uh, Laura is going to show a PowerPoint as I talk through this. And um, after the end of each introduction, I'm going to ask each of you a question. So be prepared. I'm doing it alphabetically, so Nidia, you're first. Nidia Blas is a visual artist who grew up in Ithaca, New York, and currently resides in Atlanta, Georgia. She holds a BS from Ithaca College and received her MFA from Syracuse in 2016. She's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Art and Visual Culture at Spillman College in Atlanta, Georgia. She also works as a freelance photographer for clients such as the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and the New Yorker. Nidia uses photography, collage, video, and books to address matters of sexuality, intimacy, and her lived experience as a girl, woman, and mother. She delicately weaves stories concerning circumstance, value, and power, and uses her work to create a physical and allegorical space presented through a Black feminine lens. The result is an environment that is dependent upon the belief that in order to maintain resiliency, a magical outlook is necessary. She has completed artist residencies at Constance Sultan Soul Foundation for the Arts 
and the Center for Photography at Woodstock. Her work has been featured in the book Mafon, a journal of women photographers of the African diaspora, the Huffington Post, Dazed and Confused magazine, Strange Fire Collective, Refinery 29, Hypoallergic, PDN, Photographia magazine, and more. Nidia is recognized for her body of work entitled The Girls Who Spun Gold, which is a collection of images that resulted from a girl empowerment group that she founded after observing a lack of space and community for teen girls of African descent in Ithaca, New York. In 2019, she was named One to Watch by the British Journal of Photography. I just want to add, you know, I definitely would recommend going on everyone's websites. We only have like four images just to uh, in terms of the introduction, but everyone here, I promise you, has made great work, and I highly encourage you to go onto their websites and images. So, Nidia, how's how's Atlanta? Atlanta is good. It's great. Big change, big change, right? Yes, very big change. You grew up almost all your life in the North Northeast, and now yeah, my entire my entire life. Yeah, this is my first big move. So yeah. Wow. And how, how is it hard to find models now? Different? It is. I'm like. I photograph people I know, and I don't really know anybody, especially with COVID. Um, right. But I've been doing a lot of freelance work, which is great, um, and getting to know people as much as I can. And so um, my practice has shifted, I think, a little bit, but I'm excited to kind of see what happens. All right. So I'll be back in a moment for more discussion. Uh, how, how long have you been at Spillman now? Sorry. Um, for, I mean, my second year. Second year, yeah. So it's hard, I guess. It's like a uh, to to have uh, starting school in the middle of. I mean, it's hard for students, but it's also hard for faculty. I would imagine. I feel bad for students mostly. <laughs> All right. So Rose, hi Rose. Rosemary Cromwell is a photo and video artist whose work explores the effects of globalization on human interaction and social politics. She's also interested in the tenuous space between the political and the spiritual. Rose is originally from Seattle. She spent the last 15 years between New York and Latin America and is currently based in Miami. Jealousy. Her first book, El Libro Supremo de la Suerte, was published in 2018 by TIS Books and, is, and was awarded the Lightwork Photo Book Prize. It was named one of the 25 best photo books of 2018 by Time Magazine. In this book, Rose explores the complexities of her time in Cuba through nonlinear narratives alluding to the mystical ways of luck. She is currently working on her second book, which is a 10 year project about a community living alongside the Panama Canal and history of US military intervention in Panama. She, is, she has also had solo exhibitions at Diablo Rosso Gallery and Antithesis Gallery, both in Panama City, Panama. Her work has been exhibited at Aperture Foundation in New York, Prism Art Fair in Miami, the Philadelphia Photo Art Center and the Silver Eye Art Center in Pittsburgh, among many others. Rose is a recipient of a Fulbright grant, a Getty Reportage grant, and was a light work artist in residence. She also works as a freelance editorial journalist and a commercial photographer. Clients include the New York Times, the New Yorker, Time, Calvin Klein, and Apple. She is represented by Claxton Projects. Rose is also a small wave surfer and became a mother last December. How is it with an infant, by the way, in doing this COVID stuff? Um, you know, I think having an, an infant is better than having a five-year-old, perhaps, because she doesn't need to be in school. Um, and I've also been able to spend a lot of time with her. Yeah. When otherwise, you know, I would maybe be traveling a lot for work. Sure. So, I, I another, big, another question I have is, what's it like to have a gigantic billboard and to like be on the street and see that image? You know, I've only experienced it through like my phone. <laughs> you haven't seen it in person? No, I haven't been on, I haven't left uh, Florida in a year. Ah, so, ah, so yeah. I, I gave, you know, I gave birth and then COVID started. So I oh haven't my seen God. it. Wow. So Yasser, yeah, you should go see it and tell me. I've seen it. it. You know, I, I've you have seen it. So I was like, I was like, wow. <laughs> I was jealous actually, to be honest, when I thought that was my reaction. <laughs> but it, it's great. It was really great to see. Thank you. All right. Um, next up is Ohima. Ohima Dixon is a photographer located in the New York area. She received her BFA last spring from SU. Her interdisciplinary work focuses on capturing moments of the Black experience 
and Black feminine narratives through the mechanisms of Afrofuturist thought and the archive. Since graduating, the pandemic has brought challenges. However, she's been able to work through it and achieve many things. In the wake of the unrest in June, she was able to produce a print sale of her work with 100% of the profits going towards Black Visions Collective, raising over $2,500. Additionally, she has produced her thesis, which is now on show, on show at the Candela Gallery in Richmond, Virginia until December 31st. She's additionally published a book, a photo book titled Tanpa Izin, which is available internationally and featured in publications such as Office Magazine and the British Journal of Photography. It's a great book. It, it, um, that has to do with your travels in Indonesia. Highly recommend. Um, Ohima also works contractually for Sky High Farm and Comme des Garçons doing digital communication. So Ohima, I actually have two questions for you. One not so serious and one a little bit more serious. Uh, how does one get an employee discount for- I'm Mira. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first time I mentioned yes too. <laughs> Right now I'm on contract because like that's part of the thing with the pandemic. So I don't even have a discount yet. I just kind of do contractually and I'm really close with the team over there. But what I what I know, I'll let you know. Because Just in case anyone from Comme des is listening, I'm wearing one of your shirts. Uh, <laughs> kind of promotion. So if you want to give me a discount <laughs> through Ohima, totally uh, uh, please. Uh, but a more serious question. What, what was it like to, uh, to, to put your work in the, in the sort of heart of the Confederacy, the old capital of the Confederacy? What was the reception like? Well, it was super interesting because it was right at the time of the election. The day my show opened was actually like the day that it was like I've decided. So like as I was driving up the street to see everything, there was like a group of like Trump supporters like blocks down at the city hall. Um, but Richmond's a really interesting place for those conversations because it's a city that represents, it was a heart of the Confederacy. And now a lot of those ideas are being taken down, but those old attitudes are still there. Um, so it made a really interesting kind of dynamic in the town. I think if you've been there, it's like a lot different than what you expect, um, especially like the main arts row there. Um, but it brought up a lot of interesting conversations and people for sure. In, in a way, it's almost like a site specific project. It's almost like the perfect place to yeah, and I, I didn't think about it at first when it first happened, and then as I like was thinking about like the placement of it, um, it, it was like very serendipitous, like kind of what was happening. Cool. So uh, next up is Aaron Geideman. Aaron's undergraduate thesis in 2013 culminated in a photo book titled "I Can See Right Through You." This work chronicles the ramifications her best friend faced after he was shot in the stomach during a mugging in 2010. Working with both candid and staged images, film and digital formats, Aaron combined a unique sequence of images that articulated the intimacy, alienation, and pain caused by the events. I Can See Right Through You has been featured in several publications, including Musée Magazine, GUP Magazine, F-Stop, and Burn. And selected photographs have been exhibited in group shows at the Cincinnati Art Museum, the Center for Fine Art Photography, in Fort Collins, Colorado, Yes Sir Art Center in Paducah, Kentucky, Barrett Art Center in Poughkeepsie, New York, Beard and Well Galleries in Norton, Massachusetts, and Portobello Photography Gallery in, the, in London. Since graduation, Erin relocated to her hometown of Cincinnati, Ohio, and shifted focus from creating art to supporting artists. For the last five years, she has worked at the Cincinnati Art Museum, starting in the museum's mailroom, Erin leveraged the skills obtained during her undergraduate studies and within a year pivoted to a position in the museum's marketing department. As project manager of design and marketing for the museum, she was responsible for the management of the museum's award-winning quarterly magazine, 1881, as well as the countless other design projects. In addition, Erin aids the marketing department in creating photographic assets for publication and social media accounts. Hi, Erin. Hi, Osser. <laughs> so uh, a little bit of like interesting art history. Um, a lot of you may have in your back of your head, Cincinnati was the site of a very famous court case back in 1989, uh, your sister museum, I think the Cincinnati Contemporary Art Center. You are correct. The, uh, the uh, curator there, Dennis Barry, was actually arrested for obscenity for um, curating a show on Maplethorpe back in 1989, he was eventually found not guilty. 
But I figured uh, as, as you work in the marketing department and public relations, you probably have access to a lot of complaints <laughs> from, from, uh, from uh, the public. You wanna, can you share any of those kinds of more interesting complaints that you've heard? Um, well, most of the complaints that I receive are about the magazine that I uh, manage. Um, and most of them have to do with um, legibility. So we, um, I actually sit on my museum's accessibility committee. So I'm always striving um, to make my magazine more successful so I can get rid of those complaints. Cool, thank you. Um, next up, Joe. Joe Lingaman grew up between Indiana and Ohio, the son of a sculptor and a librarian. He likes to make pictures that are fun to look at, especially when they involve food, garbage, or banal objects and spaces. His work has appeared in New York Magazine, Time, The New York Times, Vanity Fair, Allure, and his work has been exhibited nationally. Joe graduated from our MFA program in 2013. He lives in New York, New Paltz, New York, with his wife and two children. And so uh, Joe's, uh, Joe is another person I would definitely recommend going through his website and his Instagram, but just like this, carnival of beautiful color and beautiful lighting. He's like a, a true stylist. Uh, it's really great to, to see to see his work. I have a couple, two of my favorite images actually in there. Um, one was the, the, the bus photograph. I think that's next on the slide. Yes, this, was, this, was this part of an assignment? Uh, no, um, but this is a bus. So do you, do you, okay, so I'll tell you, I guess. Yeah. So I live in New Paltz and I, from New Paltz, there is a, a trailways bus that drives from here to the city. That's like how people commute in and it's like an hour and a half drive. And it's sort of like, um, if you've ever seen Jim Jarmusch's, Jim Jarmusch's Dead Man, the scene where he like travels from New York City, like out West, the like riders on the bus sort of gradually become more like grizzled um that's kind of like um what it's like to ride this bus you sort of start at this like rural outpost and then you go um into port authority um anyway so these are the buses right they're like this tacky stuff yeah it, yeah, it just reminds me of so many like i think we've all experienced like a greyhound or a trailblazer's bus and you're like how did i yeah this is a trailways yeah it's <laughs> That's great. Uh, and then I think there's another picture after this. It's a, uh, of, is this, is it, was this a, a commercial work or was this more personal work? No, it's, that was uh, uh, at a Holiday Inn Express. Uh, in, I think it was like in Chinatown. Uh, but this is just, per it wasn't like, you weren't working for Holiday Inn specifically. No, 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 this is just, this is just, what I like about your work is sometimes it's, it can be hard to tell like where where the commercial begins and where the where the art begins. I think that's true for a lot of you, uh, actually. But uh, I think more, most specifically with with Joe's work, it's like I love I love these last two images, by the way. Thanks, Yasser. Um, so uh, last but not least, we have Jamie. Jamie Pershing's personal work has been largely environmentally based. His largest project, was, which he has been working on for three years, revolves around the Onondaga Lake, which is about five miles northwest of the university, for those of you not from Syracuse. It was considered the most polluted lake in America 25 years ago. For the seventh generation is a research-based body of work that combines present day imagery, archival photographs, and images created with the assistance of the polluted waters of Onondaga Lake. Jamie has stayed in Syracuse to continue working on his thesis project in order to turn it into a book. He currently has a job as a canvasser at a local environmental nonprofit called Citizens Campaign for the Environment. And recently he began working part-time at Lightwork to assist with printing and distribution of the States of Change fundraiser. He most recently designed a virtual exhibition with CNI, CNY Arts for an annual show, which had to be online due to COVID. Jamie grew up outside Washington, D.C. and has bicycled from New York City to San Francisco with his sister in the summer of, of 2017. Hi, Jamie. Hello. How are you doing? So you, I'm doing all right. You and Ohima are like our, our most recent. I mean, you got both graduated in, oh, yeah. in, in, in this crazy moment. COVID uh, grads, yeah. 
Um, but what I want to ask you actually is about uh, any thoughts about graduate school? Oh yeah, um, I definitely am planning on it at some point. I need a break from education for a while. Spent the last, I don't even know how many years, like 15 years in education. So I'm taking a break, like doing something with my life and then definitely in the next couple of years thinking about grad school. Yeah, okay. So um, that's, that's our bios. Uh, I'm going to start asking questions. Um, don't feel like everyone has to answer every question. I'm going to probably, um, first question I'm going to actually point initially to Rose and Joe, uh, but obviously everyone can, can jump in at a certain point. Partly because I'm asking you because you guys are, you know, hustling, you're on your, 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 your paychecks are dependent upon um, freelancing. And so I just wanted to get your sense of what publishers and employers are looking for right now in terms of uh, photograph photography in the field and how COVID is, has affected everything. Um, I found a lot of magazines have actually closed down, not to be, not to start off on a negative note, um, but I'd say, you know, um, especially, you know, I had a couple of travel magazines as clients and they're, they're, they're gone or they're on hold for now. Um, but I also feel like now the landscape is really about pitching, um, you know, coming to, to publications with stories, which is something that I started, I have always done. So I, I'm in luck, but now it's even more competitive. Um, so, um, I do, you know, I, I think a lot of people I know are still working, you know, it's not like it's, um, there's still jobs to be had for sure. Um, so it's not all negative, but just, I think things are just changing all the time, you know, and editors are moving around, creative directors are moving around, nothing is, is, is static. How is it you for, for you, Joe? What's, what's the sense of things? Um, I think people definitely want, I mean, I, I shoot mostly kind of still life and food um, and definitely the kind of work that I, the kind of still life work that I do is, you know, people are definitely looking for a unique voice. Um, I think my understanding is that, you know, there's, there's a time where, you know, you just sort of take direction from an art director, um, sort of execute what they want. And I, I, when I was assisting, I assisted on jobs like that. Um, but that's not usually the kind of stuff that people end up hiring me for. I think, you know, kind of the stronger your voice as an author is or voice as an artist is kind of the better off you're going to be. Um, COVID has not been bad for me. Um, well, I think it kind of halted some momentum that I, that my career had. Um, but um, I have a studio at home and I can kind of play stylist. <laughs> um, so I've been able to shoot a lot of stuff here, um, some commercial work even, um, as well as some magazine work. So that's been the, good. What's that? Did you set up the studio beforehand or did you always have that or is it, was it by Yeah, now? I had a space that I used as a studio, but um, it became a shooting studio. <laughs> um, and if uh, my commercial clients are like beauty clients, so you know they're like lipsticks and things like that. So you don't need that much space. You don't even have much space, but you can't get a deep shadow, really, um, just because it's like small and the walls are white. Um, but uh, but yeah, as far as what um, employers are looking for and what photo editors are looking for, I think definitely like a strong, strong creative voice for sure. Um, I also thank you, Joe. I also wanted to hear from uh, our most recent graduates. You, you're the ones I think they're dealing with it the, in, the, in a way the most intensely. Ohima, Jamie? Mm, Jamie first. <laughs> oh boy. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know, because I didn't like end up going directly into something related to my field. So I've, I, found a, I found a job to pay my rent. Um, that's like how I went about it, um, given that COVID's been just kind of crazy and the job market especially in the Syracuse area, which is where I knew I wanted to be, is not the most lucrative for the photo world. Um, but I don't know, I think the biggest things I've found not even related to like 
any sort of art skills is just like your interpersonal skills and how you're able to interact and make connections with people and use those connections to advance yourself in whatever direction you want to go, even if it isn't art based. Um, and I think I, from the university, that's one of the biggest things I learned. Um, and then translating that into the employment world, um, just that that's like been the biggest thing for me is how you're able to keep connections and keep up to date with people. Yeah, I found similar. Um, I, in terms of like shooting active work right now, I honestly like around like maybe September, this all got a little too bleak for me. So like, I just kind of wanted to focus on my old stuff and not work on anything new. So I didn't really like put in my usual efforts for things. I'm supposed to start shooting editorial for Teen Vogue in the new year, but I don't even have my camera right now for like post. I'll just like keep it real. <laughs> Um, I don't even have my camera now for like any like really new work besides just finishing up old stuff. But really what I found um, is just I've been approached by editors and just kind of like keeping up those kind of relationships in general. Um, and also um, the number one thing I did that I think that helped me was I made a skill set outside of photography, which was communications. Um, and so what I found is that um, those two realms interact in like a really nice way. So a lot of times I'll be in a place um, working with like, you know, calm, let's say, and then I'll be brought in then for photo. Um, and so that's kind of been what I've been doing lately um, in terms of that and like shooting active stuff and yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, my next question, and then this is what we in the business call a leading question. Um, how did the photo program help you prepare for professional life? And this is where you're supposed to really gush about SU. So I'm, I'm gonna start with Nydia for this one. Why, thank you. <laughs> um, I think that I talk about this when I give my artist talk a lot, is that I think undergrad helped me um, like solidify that photography was something that I wanted to do and that I wanted to use photography as a tool to talk about things that were really important to me like race and, and gender and sexuality. And then I think at SU, uh, what was really important um, that I really took away was how to like go about making a body of work, like really figuring out uh, what the work needs, what is the, the best way I would say even simply from like shooting, like how to go about like getting what I need in terms of uh, my ideas, right? And then I think at one point my work needed lighting. And so then there was that. So I think Crit was like a good space for that um, uh, to figure out those types of things. Like, um, and then I also worked with books or I worked with video or I worked, you know, different ways to figure out, um, you know, the best way to see my work or interact with the work. Um, but I also think the connections that I made at Syracuse were really important. Um, I think uh, people that I'm in school, I'm like working with now or they reach out to do things or Leah just edited some of my photos for me the other day, <laughs> stuff like uh, that. So has was really helpful, but yeah. Right. And I think somewhere in there, I was just decided that I was going to teach um, somewhere at Syracuse. I was like, I'm just going to teach and I'm going to make some work that I really want to make. And people are going to like reach out to me to ask me to make work like my work. And and so luckily, that's kind of I manifested that. It's worked out well. Yeah. Aaron, how about you? Can you talk a little bit about your experiences at SU and working in a museum? Yes, of course. So I think one of the most instrumental things um, that I got from the SU uh, program was my work experience. Um, and so I was awarded a work study grant um, for all four years while I was there. Um, and through that, I was able to get um, two separate jobs that I think very much um, informed my later career decisions. So for my freshman and sophomore year, I worked in an art gallery in downtown Syracuse that I think now is a Funkin' Waffles, um, <laughs> as things kind of go here. Um, and that experience was instrumental in getting to um, know how galleries work, installation, things like that, very applicable to the museum field. Um, and then as a junior, um, Susanna had come on as a professor and her and her um, partner were um, looking for an assistant for their nonprofit Canary Project, um, which I believe is now called Toolshed. Um, and I worked with them for two years as their assistant. Um, and I learned instrumental skills through my time working with Susanna and Ed um, that were so, are still so valuable to me to this day. Um, so I think those two big 
opportunities um, were what was what I was able to leverage um, to get into the museum field when I had relocated back home. Um, on top of that, I would say that, um, you know, the networking aspect provided by Syracuse was really great, um, but is something to consider if you are relocating back to another city um, can be something that you lose. So, um, you know, the uh, professors and things didn't really have many contacts back in Cincinnati when I come back home. Um, so it did take me a little bit longer to break into that field, I think, because of that. Um, so just something else to consider as you're um, looking at programs. Great. You know, a big part of our program is, our, is, is the thesis experience. All of you have gone through either a BFA or an MFA thesis. Any particular memories from that? I know for Jamie and Ohima, it's a, they were the ones that didn't quite get to um, complete their their thesis in the way they would have wanted to at SU, though, Ohima, you did, you did get to show it in, uh, in Richmond, but um, could any of you talk about, you know, your last year at SU and, and, and those experiences? I think um, one thing that I learned really well in my thesis was just really about the work. So the curriculum in your last year is really kind of focused on here's your idea, but what are the things kind of around and kind of extrapolating all the different aspects. Um, and I think the more and more I come into like contact with a lot of different people that work in photography, maybe with not the same background, I realize like, you know, those like little things that you pay for, like those nuances, like, you know, there's the network, but also things like having an active crit group, but also just like knowing how to write about your work. Um, and that was a big thing kind of working on that with, you know, all of our professors. And so I think that's one thing I think in terms of thesis development that was really helpful. I'll always, I've always said to like um, anyone who's ever asked me about joining a photo program is I think the number one thing that you really gain is a group of people that you can work and show your work with and get criticism from um, and learning how to like work with criticism, learning how, you know, having that many opinions available, um, you know, kind of putting your ego down when working with work and knowing how to do that. And it really helps you kind of leave it being able to look at your work um, with like, you know, a new lens and not just always your own, just all focused on what you have to say. And several of you have turned actually your thesis work into books. Like Rose, you're one of them. I feel like my, my three years in the, in the MFA program at Syracuse was an incubator for that work. You know, the work I came into the program looks so different than the work three years later that I went out with it. And it's you know, probably been one of the most productive uh, times in my life uh, for my personal work. Because um, it, it gave me that time and space to really concentrate and the critical feedback that you knock and you're not gonna get else, elsewhere. And um, you know, the body of work that I developed and then continued to de develop after, after school and then eventually turned into a book has been like the launching pad of my freelance career. You know, like Joe was saying, you know, uh, ed editors, um, or Nidia was saying too, they, you know, they hire you for your strong, um, your strong personal vision. And I think that also these days that really people love to see people making personal work. You know, I know that's not why we all make it is, but um, it definitely helps to, to come out with something finished or finish something soon afterwards and publish it. And um, that, I found that to be really helpful in, in, in becoming and in going fully freelance. I also want to say that, you know, light work obviously is a huge, um, you know, meeting a lot of artists that were um, doing residencies at light work provided me with like a professional network that I wouldn't have had otherwise, which has been helpful too. Might be a good yeah. segue for Laura. She's yeah, uh, um, going to take over uh, and ask some questions. That's a question. That's a, yeah, there's a specific question about that. And a lot of you, I mean, I think all of you spent a lot of time at Lightwork in different ways. So um, Rose has already spoken about it. Um, can someone else share their experience? Joe, you worked there on your own, but also on like other artist projects. I always saw you, you were working with um, Sam and doing some work for me. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I went in a pretty different direction. My work kind of went in a pretty different direction after graduate school. Um, and I, I basically started over and I went back to like photo assisting. Um, and kind of the path to that, which I don't know if I'd necessarily advise that, um, you know, at, in your 30s. But, um, uh, but the, the catalyst for that came from um, 
some experiences at Lightwork um, working with, there was one month where uh, a photographer named Daniel Shea and uh, Kalpesh Lathigra were there and it was sort of like, oh, okay, here are these like two working photographers who are like, you know, toughing it out in the freelance world, um, taking pictures for a living. And that was kind of a, um, but let me say this, I guess, and I think this, this applies to most people's practices. I think being at light work exposed me and would probably expose a lot of people to a lot of different types of photographic practice. Um, you know, not all those people are working photographers or teaching or, um, or whatever. So because they're kind of seeing how everyone's um, sort of lives intersect with photography. Um, you know, I was able to see that at light work and that kind of led me down the path that I took for sure. Um, and um, Nydia, I know that that you were printing uh, not so long ago, like remotely at Lightwork. Have you like, um, this is one of the great things, like artists that work in residence there and also students continue to print there. Um, but I, can you talk a little bit about your experience with Lightwork? I just accepted a quote today from Lightwork. So I still get uh, um, stuff printed at Lightwork. If anybody knows me, you know that I don't edit my photos too. It's just, a uh, I was always really um, wanting to support people who are really good at that. And I just didn't put much time ever into that. I was more conceptual and worried about my vision and what I had to say. So light work was really helpful um, to me with my thesis too, and working with somebody who helped um, edit my work or I helped them edit my work. Um, and I still get stuff printed from there all the time. And I'm in touch with light work probably once a month. So yeah, it's super helpful. And Jamie, you're freelancing there now, right? Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know how many people heard about the States of Change fundraiser um, that Lightwork ended up printing, but they sold like upwards of twelve thousand prints. Um, all of the money, about one point five million dollars, is or went towards fighting voter suppression in swing states for the election. So it was like this incredibly cool fundraiser, but for those who have printed work, 12,000 prints is just kind of a ridiculous number. Um, so I'm helping out there, really just trimming and packaging prints. Um, but it's, I can't say enough about light work as far as like a, like a place and its affiliation with the university. It's, I think it, it's just one of the best things about the university is that there is this space with all of these people who are incredibly knowledgeable about what they're doing. Um, and it's just like this, this other outlet for people at the university to get affiliated with, like others have said, how you can translate your life, whatever that may be into the photo world. Um, but it's just this collection of incredible people and just like this great resource that I can't say enough about, but it's, yeah. Um, awesome. And for those who are um, tuned in, who are unfamiliar, Lightwork is a center for photography located on campus. That's a sort of a quasi-university entity. It's a partnership with the university. They have, uh, they run a residency program, an international residency program that literally any photographer of any import that you could think of from the past 30 years has come through that space either as an artist in residence or they've been published in their magazine contact sheet or they've been exhibited in their gallery. And um, we have another alumni uh, sending something in the chat. Hey, Jason. Um, it is a nonprofit. Uh, um, and uh, for people that want to support it, it's um, Doug put the link in the chat. Yes, they are a um, nonprofit and um, can always, uh, like all nonprofits, um, use additional funds. So all of our students are have memberships at Lightwork and have access to their facilities and end up, as you can hear, working really closely with the artists that come through that program. Um, so uh, I'm going to, in the interest of time, jump to our next question, which was about um, international experience. Um, some of you have, uh, like during your time as a student, participated in some of the international programs, um, some official and some less official. Um, Ohima, I know you did, and Nydia, you um, participated in a, like a one-time <laughs> only <laughs> um, situation that wasn't uh, repeated. Um, but uh, if the two of you could talk about that, Ohima, if you want to start. 
Yeah, um, so I did the regular abroad program in the fall in Italy, and then that kind of brought me into the whole world of just um, international experiences. And then I got the Creative Works grant um, from the undergraduate research office, and that was actually to do more archive-based photo um, work in Paris. Um, and then, so it was like three things at once. I did that. And then I also got hired at an arts magazine to be a, um, an arts editor there. And then I also was doing the Perry Noir program there, which was like the Black diaspora program from Syracuse, um, led by Dr. Janice Mays, um, kind of exploring that whole world. So that got me like at least four uh, months of work experience working in Paris and around. And that even brought me then down to Indonesia to do the work that I did there. Um, so I really, really valued that. And I also really valued um, it was, it's a very different scene. I think one thing I was like working in the art so heavily, not shooting a lot of active work in Paris, but just in that whole world. And just like, in particularly, it's not at all like the same, like how you can kind of move so freely and like maybe like a New York art scene this is like a lot more bureaucratic and a lot more like, you know, there's like one main school and things like that. And so it's interesting getting those different experiences. Um, I really want to go to Germany, to Berlin. They have like great public arts funding. So there's a lot of like really cool international art experiences and photo experiences um, that can be available, not just shooting, but just I think sometimes we forget as photo majors that we have a visual skill set. So just, you know, arts magazines and, you know, all these different things that you get involved in. And oh yeah, and um, I think um, that was in my last year um, getting my MFA. Got to travel. Sorry, did you want to follow up with that, Laura? Oh just... no, I, I just I, I just was sort of interested generally in, in people's experience and uh, any kind of international experience that students had had while they were at campus. It's kind of a yeah. So I just was presented with a unique opportunity to go to Rome, Italy. I think for. 10 days I went with another student and we got to work on a William Kentridge project in the city of Rome. Um, I think it was called Tetravino. Um, yeah, and it was just a really cool experience. We got to um, make videos also in addition to photos. Um, and it, I think that was like the day after the MFA show. I had to like hop on a plane to Rome, but it was, uh, it was unexpected and really, uh, uh, really dope. Yeah, so the school has official um, intern has official semester long um, experiences available in like a really wide range of places, but we also are always trying to build in these other opportunities and that was a partnership. Um, with a really long running project that we were able to um, get students involved in the actual um, final production, the work for that project had been ongoing for years. Um, so. Um, and did anyone else here do, Erin, yeah, yeah, where did you, did you go? Um, so I actually focused on my minor while I did my study abroad, which was in art history. Um, and I studied in London during my second semester of my sophomore year. Um, and while I was there, I took two very important art history classes that helped introduce me to the museum field. Um, I think each class met one day a week in class and then the other day a week at a London museum. Um, so it was just for me a really great exposure um, into that um, kind of nonprofit uh, museum field as well. I went to Berlin with, um, with Doug um, for a picture Berlin, the I think the spring of my final year at Syracuse. And that was an amazing three weeks where we visited artist studios in Berlin and we had a local uh, artist uh, facilitator, April Gertler, um, and you know went to amazing museums and galleries in Berlin. It just was an immersion in a different city that a lot of us hadn't spent time in either. Yeah, so there was a uh, picture of Berlin and then um, there was a similar project that another faculty member is running in Moscow and April, of course, um, is now running Portfolio Berlin. That's a, an independent project, but it's a really fascinating project. People are interested in that. Um, I'm going to pass questions now over to Susanna. Thanks, Laura. Um, I know Jamie also uh, spent a semester at Copenhagen, and I always say to my undergrads, like in the first year, you know, you really can go wherever you want um, globally as long as you plan it. 
Um, you know, it's, it's very easy to go to the programs where we have offer photography classes and, you know, and you don't have to plan ahead too much to do that. But like Jamie really wanted to study in Copenhagen and he was able to do that because he took care of his requirements. And while he was there, he actually didn't take that many photography classes, but he planned ahead and was able to do that. Um, yeah, so I wanted, um, I wanted to ask the, the group to talk a little bit about how social media um, functions for you professionally. Um, you know, I, this is sort of a, a really, I think, important emerging um, method for promoting your work. And, um, and I just hoped you could talk a little bit about that. I'll, I'll just throw it out to everyone because I think you all are doing um, great things with, with your Instagram. Well, maybe I'll point to Joe because I love your, <laughs> I love your Instagram, Joe. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, Instagram for me is huge. Um, I think my first meeting with a photo editor, he just sent a quick email. Um, he said he found my work on Instagram. You know, I don't even have like that many followers. You know, I'm not like Instagram famous. Um, but I remember there came a point um, where I felt like, okay, you know, like I have all these pictures and I'm not really, they're not like out in the world. Um, and I just kind of decided one day I'm just going to like put you know, real photographs on Instagram. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so uh, I don't, I, you know, what happens after that, I have no idea, but I think that started um, again when I started, when I finished my degree, started working in the city as a photo assistant. Um, I started assisting with uh, this guy, Daniel Arnold. Does anyone know Daniel? Daniel Arnold? Okay. Um, I think uh, getting to know him, uh, his, he's a street photographer who's, I think came to prominence through Instagram, I think. Um, and working with him and being in contact with him, I was like, oh, maybe this is like a legitimate platform. But now, you know, like art directors and photo editors um, are constantly kind of coming to me from Instagram. That's like, I had a meeting with um, Gemma Fletcher, who's like an art director type person. She does these mentorship um, sort of sessions. Um, and she's like, yeah, the first thing that a photo editor or an art buyer is gonna look at, is gonna be your Instagram, then your website, um, at least in the kind of commercial, commercially world. So it's like everything kind of for me. Yeah, social media has been like, I think, definitely the number one thing that has connected like so much, like, just like a random anecdote, like one day, like I logged on, and I see this DM, this is Wolfgang Hillman's, and I thought it was like a spam account. And then there was like the real person saying that he like liked my work, and like wanted to like, get involved. I was like, wait, what? It was confusing. And like, just that goes to show just like the world that lies out there, I think my first collector came off of Instagram. I think almost any editor I've ever met came off of Instagram. I constantly am like reaching out to like editors of magazines on Instagram. <laughs> so it's like definitely a place where so much happens, especially because it's one of the main places where we have image proliferation that exists on a platform. And it's so, so powerful. I'm like kind of bad where like, I don't really post like my work, like very like, you know, whatever. Um, but still like just as a tool and like who you can meet off of there and just the accessibility um like I've met like huge figureheads off of that I got jobs off of it you know whenever I send an email to anyone I always follow up on Instagram DM I'm like I know it's you know not normal but I just wanted to make sure I reached out here as well and you know it's been really really helpful in that sense that's great advice I love that yeah. anyone else oh yeah go ahead Rose it's a good research tool as well. You know, you kind of, um, you can figure out, sometimes it can be, can be hard to figure out who works where, like if you want to work for a certain magazine or a newspaper, but everybody's on Instagram. And usually when other photographers work for other people, they tag them. And so when I was starting out, I found, uh, I did a lot of my research through Instagram. And I also find that people will hire you like for your casual photography, or they also will know where you are because you're posting on Instagram. And um one thing too I forgot to mention when you guys asked about what people are looking for these days and especially in times of COVID I think 
they like they want it to and when the photographer has to do a lot more like perhaps photograph you know people around them or produce they they want to know a little bit more about you and however it's hard for me to you know to put myself out there but i think it's important these days that you have a little bit of online personality um yeah great um what about you aaron i mean you're actually in marketing so i'd love to hear your um yeah um, social media is um, instrumental for the museum. Um, I know we have kind of switched gears in the past four years that I've been working with them from doing mostly print advertising to uh, social media advertising. Um, I know the museum uh, focuses mostly on our Facebook page and our Instagram account, um, but we have, you know, seen success with other people um, starting to use TikTok and um, some of the newer platforms that are coming out as well. Um, but I think one of the main things that we have found just kind of as a nonprofit institution, and, you know, if you're somebody that wants to start a magazine or, you know, your own sort of nonprofit, um, paid promotion on social media platforms works. Um, you can get all sorts of data analytics, um, all sorts of anything. Um, and it's uh, just a really great way um, to kind of um, reach your audience um, and develop an audience and to gain a following. Um, I think on top of that, I would also say that um, I think, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, Oh, um, I found a lot of um, job opportunities and uh, calls for entry on um, Instagram and Facebook as well. So I think you can find a lot of resources um, like that upon those platforms. There's a great Instagram account called pickuptheflow.xyz or something, and they post like art grants like every single day. Um, and there's like lots of accounts like that. I think it's pickuptheflow. I'll, I'll find it and I'll put it, but there's like, there's so many great resources like all the grants and everything that are on there, jobs. It's really great for that stuff. I, I think we could do a whole panel on, on social media. Thanks, Elohim, it'd be great if you could put that in the chat. Um, well, we've, we've, we're wanting to move to Q&A in about six minutes. So I'm actually gonna hand it over to Doug um, to um, take over the, the questions. So I have, I have sort of the, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, the mop-up questions, which um, the first one is really simple, but hard, um, which is where do y'all see yourselves in five years? Which, you know, because I, I, I'm of, of a certain age, I know that five years go by really quick. So my answer would be, I'd be five years older, but um, I also know that you all are a really, if not, you know, you're very ambitious, um, group of people. And I have seen your trajectory. I mean, looking at like sort of certainly Rose, Joe, and Nidia who have been out the longest. Um, Aaron as well, actually. Um, you know, you you are on a really good five-year plan, you know. I, I'm I'm very impressed of where how you landed and where and what you have done. So if you could talk about maybe just where you're headed, some things that maybe you have in the works and um, how you kind of organize yourselves to achieve your goals. That would be terrific. Um, I can talk. Uh, geez, I just was realizing I need some new goals. I've kind of like met the goals that I had and felt like I was working towards for a long time. Um, I'm a really be big believer in like manifesting what you want. Um, and, uh, and so I, I don't know, I'm feeling, I'm working on some books right now. I'm talking about a, a book of the girls who spun gold. I'm working on another book, um, for some work that I'm making about the South and about Atlanta. Um, so that's really great because books was something that I was kind of doing at first at Syracuse and then I kind of fell off. So it's nice to return to them. I've been looking at some of my uh, work that I've never done anything with that's and kind of making sense of that, some Polaroids and some other stuff. Um, but yeah, I just see myself, I would like to, I think, shoot some more fashion um, photography. Um, so I'm kind of thinking more commercial in that way. I really like teaching. I'm in a 10 year track position um, and I really like Atlanta. And so I see myself here for a while. Um, and yeah, so I'm working on some new goals. I also really like making video. I'd like to work maybe in video or films. And so, yeah, so. I'm going somewhere. I just have to figure it out. And then, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, you definitely are going somewhere. It's great. It's great to hear that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Well, Rose, I know you're you're working on. You have a book in the works, right? Um, and um, you know, it's an amazing book because yeah, I've seen I've seen it. It's really fantastic. You want to talk about where you're where you're headed and a new child as well. So yeah. Um, yeah, the, I'm working on this, uh, a second book that's been a long-term project um, about a community um, uh, that, that was located next to the Panama Canal, an old U.S. military barracks, and I, I worked there. Um, I helped found a nonprofit with uh, a pastor who, who grew up there, and um, I photographed a lot of uh, some of his adopted boys, and then also... Um, um, I'm not only telling the story of coming of age in the space, but also the, uh, the, the like a parallel history of uh, U.S. military intervention in Panama. And so I'm trying to combine these, you know, a personal narrative with a political narrative. And my book now is like all over my wall in my studio. And I think it's going to be a one or two year process. You know, my uh, the last book I took, I published, took a couple years after, you know, putting um, the images on the wall and editing it into a book and. And, but I, I mean, I'm trying to embrace this process. You know, for me, photography, making the images is the fun part and putting it all together is the confusing and, and hard and complicated part for me. Um, but, you know, that's really my five-year goal is to spend more time on personal work. And now that, you know, I spent the last five years developing a stable freelance practice, um, uh, I feel like now my, you know, my next five-year goals are to go back into the studio and spend more time on personal work, you know, through, um, through grants or through print sales, you know, I'm not exactly sure how, <laughs> but, but that, that's probably in the next five years. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Anyone else? Joe, what do you got going? Um, so I feel like I'm on the earlier part of Rose's curve I feel like I'm still kind of um getting serious I shouldn't say getting serious because I am serious obviously but like I need to sort of level up um my commercial work um most of what I'm shooting is editorial stuff um and I have a you know a couple commercial clients so right now I'm in a pretty serious push to find a rep um who can sort of help me mm -hmm. um you know with as much of the picture um uh as they can um you know when from you know bidding higher to um you know figuring out contracts and things like that um definitely i need to learn motion which i have like very little experience with mm -hmm. um so that's a major thing that i feel like i have to kind of wrap my arms around um um, and I think that's going to be important probably for every photographer. I mean, it is now. Um, so. That's something that I found that people are also asking for a lot now these days is video yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But Joe, I'm going to tell you, I get, I get always so jazzed when I see your work and I, and I get Thanks. really excited when I look at an image and I go, I think that's Joe. And then I check the credit and I did. Sometimes yeah. like, it, it's good. So it's really terrific. Cool. Aaron, well, you start, you, um, yeah, no, it really is. It really is amazing. Yeah, so it's cool Aaron, to see you yourself in a magazine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, out. isn't like, it? Oh, cool. Even if it's like a weird beauty product. Oh, good. Oh, good. Um, Aaron, you, you started, you know, did it, am I, did I hear that right? You were, you were in the mail room there in, uh, yes, in, that's amazing. So you, you had, <laughs> you you i don't know man i don't know if you plotted your rise you're like okay i so i got to it's interesting um because the reason i ended up at the museum was the job that i was working at prior um where i was at fidelity investments um <laughs> trying to just uh, make money to you know pay your expenses and not caring about necessarily being in the field and doing art on the side um i found that that was not the path for me um, but I was able to leverage that skill. Um, you know, the mailroom position at the museum was in the finance department. And so that was my, um, my I guess my um, entry into that field was through my finance experience, not necessarily my art experience. Um, but my interview was with the CFO and I was very transparent with her of that this was not my end goal. 
um, that I was going to use this position to show you what I was capable of and you were going to promote me. Um, and it happened within 11 months. Um, there was an opening over in the marketing department, um, you know, and my current boss, Jill Dunn, who is a, um, an incredible mentor to me, um, just professionally and what have you, um, you know, recognize my skills in photography. Um, you know, there was a marketing department of two people. They didn't have a photographer that was making, um, you know, things for their brochures, their social media accounts. Um, and she wanted my skill set. So um, within, you know, that 11 months, I got that promotion. I think I've had four job titles at the museum. Um, so now I'm the project manager of design and marketing. Um, and as for where I see myself going in five years, um, right before the pandemic, I was interviewing for a job in Seattle um, at the Fry Museum of Art for, um, I think it was a director of public, or not a director, a manager of publications and exhibitions. Um, and I think I would really like to get more into the exhibition side. Um, of the museum field or publications. Um, now I am tied to nonprofit work for the next five years while I'm trying to get my um, federal student loans forgiven, um, but that could all change on Jan 21st if Biden signs that, um, that law. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but if I don't stay in the museum realm, um, I really enjoy working on the magazine that I manage. Um, and I could definitely um, see myself getting into fine art publishing as well. Um, so supporting artists who are making books um, and things like that. Fantastic. And just Jamie and Ohima, you are, y'all are on year one, year one of the five-year plan. So you're just beginning to take the long view, I think, right? It's, it's one of the, it's one of the things that happen when you're, when you become out on your own, you got to look a little more to the horizon and work it out. So what do you have in the works? Where do you think you're headed? Um, um, go ahead, go ahead, you go, you go, you go. <laughs> um, I think like in school for the longest time I had so many projects at once. So then I could kind of like always go to like another idea. And so I found myself in the fandom like, okay, like what's my next things that I want to do. Um, I have some work um, working off of a family archive from my family down South. Um, so I think I'm going to start working on some grant um, to get that funded. And I met some cool people um, in, at Candela in Richmond that kind of want to help me get that done. And then in the long term, I, one thing I've realized um, kind of like leaving Syracuse and not having like spaces like light work in the studio at the basement is I need a space to work. <laughs> so I'm kind of like working on finding like a cool studio space here that's just like a cool deal off. So I could like have a separate space to like do all that kind of work. Um, and I would like to get, you know, do some, do a big cycle of applying for grants and fellowships, hopefully like next year, or maybe the end of this year, who knows. Amazing. Jamie? Yeah. Um, so my biggest thing is like finishing my thesis work and planning on publishing a book um, sometime in 2021. So that's like a short term goal. And the reason I stayed in Syracuse, as far as like long term goals, um, I've been working in the nonprofit world for the last few months and I've actually loved it and think it's like this great space to be. Um, so probably continuing along that sort of trajectory and then maybe towards the end of that five years going to grad school um, is sort of like the end goal maybe around that I'll be finishing that up. I don't really know. Um, five years is a long time at this point in my life. So like, I don't know, but um, know. yeah, that's, that's, that's sort of my, my ideas. Very good, really good, really good. Um, I think we, I think we need, you know, I have a, a sort of if, if anybody has a, an additional point they want to, um, you know, get across to all that we didn't have a chance to talk about. But I think we're also in need of headed to the um, some questions from our attendees, and I think because of our timing, we might want to just jump into that unless anybody has something that. Um, I like do want to. I want to. I want to say one thing, um, yeah. which is just like, as far as this program goes, the faculty are like my favorite part of it. You guys are awesome. Um, even like post graduation, everyone's been like incredibly helpful, responsive, willing to work with me on what I'm doing now, and just like those connections for me were the most valuable thing about the program. So I just wanted to say thank you guys. <laughs> Oh, that's sweet, man. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> I think one thing I would say quickly too before the q and I think one thing I also realized graduating so quickly is how much you take for granted being in such a creative space. And I would say, I wish I printed like more work 
uh, and like print all the work you can because having spaces like light work there where you have it like in like walking distance and can print on a big printer like that like it's just I mean are there spaces like that in New York of course yes but it's not the same access um so just like use all this to like its fullest extent like having studio lighting with Yasser and like all these different things you know yeah full extent yeah back. students can always come back we're always like <laughs> super happy to welcome people to come back to Syracuse and um, yeah, actually, I wanted to, to highlight that about light work, because um, in addition to the artist residency program and the ex exhibitions and all that's going on there, it is like one of the probably state of the art printing and scanning facilities in the world. I mean, people, all kinds of professional artists uh, send their work there to be printed or come to do it. And our students actually have access to, the, to, to this to print their work, which is extraordinary. Um, so yeah, this would be a great time to uh, move into the Q&A. Um, we've got about 20 minutes and um, uh, there's a few questions um, have, are coming up in the Q&A and um, feel free to throw more in there also, um, anyone who's uh, got, got other things they want to talk about. Um, uh, Max wants to know what kind of cameras y'all use. That's a great question if you're thinking about school and what kind of equipment to come. So um, anyone want to reveal their, their tools? Nikon D850 or 10. Um. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> <Can I know? laughs> I mean, my, my personal camera is a Canon 6D, but largely I used equipment in the cage. Um, so there's like great access to other gear that I can't afford, um, especially while you're a student, which is awesome. So um, I see one of the questions is do any of you shoot on film? I shot a lot of film while I was in school. I'm doing less of that now because I can't afford it. But um, there's just any gear that you want to use is available if you're a student. Um, so that's I use like the Sony's and I use the Mamiya a lot while I was in school um so that's what I would say to that I definitely agree I loved having access to the cage and even I could check it out and take it like um, I was traveling a lot to to Cuba during that time I'd take it to Cuba um, and bring it back of course <laughs> but um you know I, I just actually ended up buying a Mamiya RZ and I used to always check that camera out from the from the cage um, I shoot on that camera, Mamiya 7, both film cameras, medium format for all my personal work and my editorial and commercial is mainly on, it's mainly digital these days, just a Canon 5D Mark V, I think, um, Mark IV, I can't even remember, but with fixed lenses and then crop it to make it look like film. But these days, like there's no time and then a lot of people don't want to pay for film and I kind of realized that if you crop it and you have, you know, you can um, have somebody who can help, or you can do it yourself to like make the colors look more filmic, then you're pretty much good to go in that regard. Yeah, I shot all film in graduate school, large format and medium format. And uh, probably a lot of what I do now is have, you know, came from the transition to digital, but I really had to like, get a fixed lens on the digital camera mm. to kind of make it feel like the Mamiya 7, you know. Um, you know, and you can get manual focus, modern manual focus lenses that will work on the Nikon cameras, so. Um. Great. Um, uh, there's a really good question here coming from um, Joshua Atkins in the um, chat. Um, and he's asking how much overlap or freedom for interdisciplinary practice is available um, in the MFA program. Um, and so um, any of you MFA folks uh, like to, to talk about that? <laughs> yes, not. Uh, my, my experience was as pretty much a straight photographer in the program, um, but I did feel like there were some opportunities, um, I think in Laura's uh, practicing in public class, that's like, co was at the time co-taught by Sam Van Aken. Um, and so, you know, that was an opportunity where I feel like we had to sort of like interact with 
you know, people outside of the transmedia world. Yeah. Oh, Rose, you're muted. Um, sorry, I think you could take whatever classes you wanted to. Well, I, I mean, I definitely remember a lot of people did like Joe or sorry, Jay was in poetry class. And, um, you know, I know I definitely interacted a lot with um, the Latin American studies department and like, and also ran a film, like a film series for them. Um, so I did, you know, I wasn't making sculptures, but I think you definitely could if you wanted to. Yeah, we have a lot of students who, you know, in their thesis incorporate um, video and sculpture. Um, so that's, that's pretty common and um, taking, and, and we really encourage uh, students to take critiques outside of the photo area as much as possible and, and welcome those students in, into our critique as well. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's really welcome. We've got a couple questions um, coming in about book publishing. Um, from Timmy and, and Rita. Um, Timmy asks, uh, to the people who publish books, how was that process? And how did you manage to find and sort through who you wanted to work with? I think I had a really different like exposure to that whole world. It was like super informal because I just happened to know two people who were starting um, this kind of like starting off in publishing and they had kind of known that I had this project at first. I, I definitely had a very different exposure to the book world than like most people do. Um, and so they approached me about it and I already had in John O'Toole's class, I had kind of developed it and kind of made it into a physical dummy. Um, so I had that all done and they kind of came and they didn't want to, you know, design. They just wanted to give me the money to sponsor um, that. So it was like a really, really nice process. Their name is Catastrophe Media. They do a lot of like cool kind of environmental and kind of their focuses on catastrophes of the world and kind of like looking at these different issues. Um, it's founded by Josie Strick and Angela Riccardi and they're really, really great. Um, so I really enjoy them and I kind of it's nice because I don't like to a lot of rules and they feel like a pretty free realm to work and everything. <laughs> um, for, for me, I had a very long road into finding the right publisher. Um, I had designed my book dummy with, an, with a designer, a friend of mine, and it was very specific and it also was complicated. My book has like some pages are half pages. There's a small book within the book. You know, I didn't, I had never published a book. So I didn't realize how expensive that would be to make a book like that. Um, and I would also became kind of stuck on that idea. So um, a lot of publishers, you know, um, were turned off by the compli complications of my book um, and, or, or slash wanted to design the book themselves. And, um, and also, you know, a lot of publishers want, um, you know, 10, 20, $30,000 like that you have to self fund. And I didn't have access to that, that, those funds. Um, so I was looking for somebody who would be able to, um, to, to, uh, you know, to front the cost of publishing. And I actually, I met um, Nelson Chan through, through Doug at one at an APAD fair, like a number of years uh, prior. And he had asked me to speak to Nelson Chan, who is a, also a teacher, had asked me to speak to one of his classes. And, um, and I had um, kind of just kept up communication with him. And that um, he was one of the publishers that I approached. And we had a number of continuing conversations about the book. And eventually, um, you know, he, he told me that if I would, you know, make some concessions and that bookmaking is an act of compromise, <laughs> that he wanted to do it. And um, I really had a great experience with, um, with TIS Books. And it was also really great that Lightwork uh, awarded the book its um, first book prize, which then we were able, uh, with, with TIS, we published 500 copies. Um, and then Lightwork, the, with the support from Lightwork, we were able to uh, make it 700 copies. So, um, but my advice would be to look at, um, to look for publishers that, um, who are making books that you like and where you think your work might fit alongside those, those other books. And then um, I know it's really tempting to approach people at book fairs, but I think that's really hard for publishers to look then, but perhaps, you know, see who, who the publishers are, are and maybe see who somebody who knows them, somebody you may know, may know them. And um, a lot of times they also have open submissions as well. 
but networking your way to somebody is, I think, a, a good approach. That sounds kind of similar to um, like galleries, right? In some ways, I feel like the book world for photography has supplanted the gallery system to a certain degree, but the process um, is similar, right? Don't cold call. If you have connections, make sure it fits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think so. Suzanne, I think you're muted, I think. Okay, okay. Um, I have an interesting question here. Um, so um, this is kind of about, I would say about like artistic motivation or and style. Um, so the question is, are there questions you ask yourself when it came to developing your personal or artistic photographic style? Or is there any advice you can give when starting this process of trying to learn yourself and how to vocalize your personal style? Does it help to see if you can find these themes in your work? Sorry, this is a long question. Um, but yeah, does anyone want to speak to that about like how you can how you find your personal style and you know where you look for that inspiration? Um, I think I can a little bit. Um, so I think it's important. I work really intuitively, so I just make things. Um, and I found my process is that I make and make. And then after, I remember doing this with Yasser, like looking at all my work on like a, a whiteboard and being like, oh my gosh, what is this about? And I felt so overwhelmed. Like I, I knew kind of what I was making and the ideas that I that I was having, but when I saw all the finished work, I was like, oh, like, what is this all about? Like, what have I been doing this entire time? And for me, I sort of worked backwards to understand um, uh, understand my work. So like what themes were reoccurring? What colors uh, were I using? What do those colors mean? Why were I, like I use gold, right? What does gold mean? What do these reference? Um, and then how does that, and then how did I tie that into the things that I was already thinking about, right? So like how to make like a color relevant and speak to the work that I was already making about a group of girls and about power and sexuality, right? And race and gender. And so I think it's really important. My bit of advice is, is to like, I know that we're in school and we have to know, right? Like that's part of school is, is the knowing part, but also I, um, I always tell my students, like, I don't want that to bog you down so much that you don't make and that you get in this spot where like you're scared to make things or you're like, I have to know, so I can't make it. Or if I don't know, I can't make it. So I would say to like, just make and make and not always think too much about it. Um, think, but don't think too much about it. And then to sort of like maybe work backwards to, to understand. Um, I remember thinking a lot about like my, even where did I first become introduced to images? Why are they even important to me? And, um, and then I think, uh, you know, you're the mo really the most important thing about your work too, right? And nobody is you, nobody is you in your body where you grew up, the experiences you had and can make the things that you make. Um, so also like reflection on yourself and like who you are as a person and where you came from and all that good stuff. I would say uh, just to piggyback on uh, Nydia's comment there, I feel like so much of what you call style kind of happens either, like by intuition or by accident. Um, and I think, um, yeah, it, I think her advice is so good to just make and make and make and then see what you made and look backward, you know, look back and kind of work backwards. Um, it's definitely what I have done in a couple of different um, stages, but um, yeah, by intuition, by accident. Actually, I remember it was, I think maybe my first week in the program, um, it was John, um, oh my gosh, Bill Viola came to talk at Lightwork and he spoke about how um, art should be like just an extension of the body and making art should just be an extension of the body. And I feel like um, uh, that, that's a thing that I think about a lot when I, when I look at one of my images or when I think about making images, like, is this my picture? You know, does this feel like something that's from me? Um, Um, those are really great responses. Thank you. Um, so this is um, more of a question for our BFA um, people on the panel. Um, Devin's asking, what's the most important advice 
you would give to an incoming photography first year student? I mean, I think for me, it's like, I went in knowing that I wanted to study photography, but no idea like what that meant at all. Um, and just like being totally open to the feedback that you're receiving from everyone else in your class. And just like, I think trying to integrate yourself with your class. I think our class is really close as far as, I, I mean, I don't really know because I wasn't in any of the other ones, but I feel like our class had really good connections with each other and just like tried, try and make your photo class your friends because I think they have so much great insight that you can take from what they're doing and they'll give you feedback on what you're doing. But like those connections, try and embrace them. I think that'd be my biggest piece of advice. Yeah, I would say definitely make friends of your peers, like speaking to Jamie here, like Jamie, I always kind of go to him when I have like certain specific questions about like, let's say like framing or like more technical things. Um, and like, you know, Jamie would kind of would go back to me and talk about more cre like creative and whatever. And having that kind of like using your classmates because we're all are talented in like various ways. And there's so many cool, cool people. I like even in like my cohort, like there's so many people. Um, and then I think another thing that kind of maybe reflects on something Nidia was saying was, I think when you first get into the photo program and like, you know, it's like kind of your first modern introduction to photography, it can be a little intimidating. You're shown like all these images and you're sitting there and you're not taking that great rid of pictures yet and you're like wait my work doesn't look like any of this like what's going on and I think I found like sometimes I would try to stifle my voice or try to make it look like other things and I would say like your freshman year to just like metaphorically word vomit like every idea you have shoot it any question you have you know do it and just put it all out and then start to sort through like don't worry about I think I kept trying to make like good work my freshman year and like I just needed to accept the reality that it wasn't going to be that great in terms of like a long run but just like pushing it all out there and like letting yourself really be like free creatively and then kind of working back and then filtering from there is a lot easier sometimes I think than trying to start off and do specific things. Um, we have a great question from a high school photography um, teacher in, uh, in Florida, actually, um, and asking uh, advice, and I think this is kind of a question for the, the faculty, um, asking about um, what students, high school students should think about as they're putting together their portfolios um, for applications. Um, I, I think students' um, conversations about relying on each other in terms of getting advice from their peers, show that work to somebody else. Um, it's possible to do a portfolio review before submitting your portfolio. You can reach out to the recruiting department, but also like show your friends. If you have a program at school, talk to your teachers, um, ask your family, right? To get some, to get outside of your own head to a certain degree um, is really useful in that regard. Uh, because, you know, the other really simple thing to say is, oh, show your best work. But it's, as you can um, hear from everyone's conversations, it can be sort of difficult to negotiate that, to kind of parse that out. Um, another, another takeaway that uh, I think the panelists also um, sort of put out here is, um, try to communicate who you are and what makes you you because that's something we're going to look for and there's a couple ways to do that certainly it's through the work to a certain degree but remember there's a writing component in your application and that's one of the best ways that we can hear your voice and um if we when we come across a singular voice that seems um full of potential um that's speaks to us immediately, immediately. So work on that writing. Um, tell us who you are, tell us what's in your head and um, you're gonna do great. And I would just add to that. I think one, one thing I, you see a lot of is students will do, feel like they need to do a travel photograph and a portrait and a document. You know, they, they, they feel like they need to cover the full range, full genre of photographies. But I would advise students to, you know, pay attention to what they care about most. We're not looking for 
someone who can photograph 10 different kinds of things, but someone who has a, a clear point of view. Yeah, I totally agree uh, with that, with what Yasser just said, um, is like for us to be able to see that someone is already developing a voice or, you know, has ideas is, is really important. And that's what we want to, that's what we'd love to see in the portfolio. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question here. Um, but the, the faculty are going to stay on after, um, so, so that if there are questions from um, possible applicants, we can answer them. Um, but this question is, um, this might be geared more towards recent graduates, but I was wondering uh, what was going through your minds as you started your final year at Syracuse and might have realized that you would no longer have immediate educational safety, um, the safety bubble and the university resources. Is there any advice that you would give seniors in their last year? Anything you, you know, would make sure you do before you graduate. Um, so yeah, anyone want to take that one on? Sounds like one of our students. I know, yeah. so I was just going to say. Um, I mean, the, the, this last year has been just a disaster, um, like on, on the, in all, all, every sense of the word. Um, so I feel like, I don't know, but I, I think you could do it in a pandemic. So in a year, hopefully we're no longer in this part of 2020. So um, it's, I don't know, I think, I think there's so many opportunities out there in so many different parts of the world that even if immediately you're not being, not throwing yourself into your own field, there's so many different ways that you can apply yourself and your skill sets and to not put too much pressure on those first like two months out of school, like it's, it's going to be okay. <laughs> I think what I would say um, is think about like, maybe like just like past like thesis and photo stuff, but just think about like where it is that you want to go after school and um, start doing research on places that are like studio and printing spaces um, before you get there. Um, I think one thing I'm just kind of being lazy maybe, or just a little bit shy, but I'm, it's hard for me to like now like, go do this work to like find this new space that's not light work because I just don't want to leave it. <laughs> um, and so kind of like doing that work beforehand so that you feel a little more comfortable perhaps and you know kind of like know their facilities. Um, and I think the next thing I was gonna say um, is it's really nice like living in like art and things like that but it doesn't start off like that immediately is one thing I would say and I would say that even though you're developing your thesis and I, you know, I know this like maybe like super like, and I, I'm not a very corporate person, but it sounds like it, is get it, find a job. <laughs> um, you're gonna get out there and like, you know, photo jobs like aren't gonna be like right away. Um, you know, start off like doing like, you know, great commissions like right out of school and stuff. Um, and just like find something for you, whatever that is that pays your bills. Um, don't just think about your thesis. Um, like think about also like how you're gonna have a roof so you can make more work. Um, and I think sometimes that can be like kind of like lost on sometimes like photo students because like you focus so much on the photo and then you're like, oh wait. Um, and so kind of like doing that work back from like November, um, you know, back from early about just like, what is it exactly that I'm gonna do to make all these great things happen eventually? Cause it doesn't always happen right off the bat. Also just adding to that, I think for me, going to Syracuse was so much more than just the photo program. Um, so like, for me, I partially decided to go there because it's a huge university with all these other opportunities in different disciplines. Um, and so like Ohima said, like realizing that you don't have to be in that photo world right off the bat. Like I didn't start there and now it's sort of developing in that way for me and like opportunities are coming up, but like, there's so many opportunities at the university to learn things in different disciplines and like using that and realizing that you have skills outside of photo. Um, yeah. I would say the two best also skill sets that I would say that I like observe in like my work um, is with just a photo background is communications and UX design. If you can take a class web design or in like communications before you leave and build and also a video class I wish I did that um, those three things are like they keep coming up in jobs and like I'm I've taught myself web design 
in communications, but I wish I had a new video. So just those three things tie in really nicely with the photo background and um, being really useful for a job, actually extremely useful. Um, hey, that is totally golden advice. Um, I really agree. Um, and uh, and it, it's, it's, it's almost still November. So oh, Ohima um, recommended that you start looking for your job in November, but we're close enough. So, so I think you'll have time. Um, I'm also so, available. Yeah, I feel like, oh, sorry. I feel like one thing too is that like, I wish I reached out to more alum and like knew that they were there. And I feel like I would, I mean, I'm, I, I'll answer anything like to anybody, like any email or DM. I like wanna be like a, like, you know, a help that I didn't, not that I didn't get, but like, I didn't know that I had there. So I'm like super, super open, like whatever, whatever resources that I have, or like even just talking like to any student. Um, yeah, and you know, it's it, what, what you just mentioned um, makes me think that this kind of event is like a really nice way for Alum to reconnect. Um, and we're actually gonna do another one of these in January um, from Lightwork. And I know there were a lot of, um, there was a lot of interest in light work. So we'll be there um, for the next one and sending out info about that. Um, but just like a huge thanks to the panelists. Um, this has been fantastic. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, thanks everyone for participating. It was really great to see you all. Really, really nice to see you all. The next alumni party at Yasser's is going to be really, really big. <laughs> the next time we meet in person, I don't know, we might have to um, annex the next door building or something. <laughs> yeah, and rent some private jets. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Is this going to be in 2023? <laughs> something like that. No, I, I, I actually do think that, uh, I really do think we're going to have a normal fall. Optimist. I'm an optimist, but I think Fingers crossed. I, I do think I, my guess is that there's going to be some kind of mandate for vaccines and that they seem to be very effective. And I think we're going to have a normal fall. I'm an optimist, but it's true. Okay. Um, the faculty is going to stay on uh, if people have questions. And um, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for having us. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. Bye guys. Bye. Super proud of you guys. Good job. Definitely. Thanks. Thanks. Hi guys. Bye guys. Bye.